in our lives. Sometimes we have to sacrifice and take risks, and sometimes these risks are not always justified and can make things worse. However, in my case, I think the risk was justified. At least I was able to stand up to my unfaithful wife. It was Friday afternoon at 4 p.m. For those unfamiliar with military time used in law enforcement, that's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Government offices generally quiet down around this time on Fridays, and our offices at the Mason County Sheriff's Department were no different. Shift change had passed at 3 p.m., and most staff with regular office hours had left early, using some of their accumulated comp time. My captain and chief deputy Benito Ben Villanueva had left at noon that day to take his family on a weekend getaway to the Twin Cities. Meanwhile, I was eagerly awaiting the return of Deputy Christopher Hayes, my day shift lieutenant, from an important assignment I had given him earlier in the week. If you find this video interesting, please hit the like button. If not, please hit the subscribe button. My name is Sean Patrick Quinn Jr., but everyone knows me as Pat. I was recently elected and sworn in as the sheriff of Mason County. Today marked the end of my first official week in office, having been sworn in the previous Monday morning. Initially, I had tasked Chris Hayes with an assignment right after the swearing-in ceremony, intending for him to carry it out later that day. However, I had a change of heart and postponed it until this afternoon. One of the responsibilities of lieutenants is to deliver warrants, notices, and official documents upon request. The sheriff's office charges $80 for this service to the public, a fee I considered money well spent. Therefore, I assigned my trusted lieutenant the job of serving divorce papers to my soon-to-be ex-wife, Clarissa. This afternoon, as I sat in my office, I eagerly awaited his arrival to hear how it went. At around 4.03 p.m., a visibly furious lieutenant Chris Hayes stormed into my office. The next time you decide to get divorced, Pat, you can personally deliver those damn papers to that woman. I guess the serving didn't go smoothly. I chuckled. Look at this, Pat, Chris said, pointing to the right side of his face. His cheek and ear were bright red. That crazy woman slapped me across the face. She did what? I couldn't believe it. I'm not kidding. I handed her the papers, and she slapped me across the face. Oh my god. I burst into laughter. That's the most incredible thing I've ever heard. Please tell me you're serious. Absolutely not, I'm serious, he stated, settling into the chair across from my desk. She came to the door, and I politely asked if she was Clarissa Marie Quinn. She confirmed it. I then said, Clarissa Marie Quinn, you have been served. She completely lost it, got into a heated argument with me, started crying hysterically, and topped it off with a forceful slap right across my cheek and ear. You have no idea how much it stings to get slapped on the ear like that, Pat, even coming from a woman. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I managed, struggling not to burst out laughing. I'm not laughing at you getting slapped, I'm just amazed she lost her cool like that. Then a sudden realization hit me. Oh my god, please, please, please tell me you had your lapel camera rolling during all of this. Please tell me you were smart enough to have it on. If you find this video interesting, please hit the like button. If not, please hit the subscribe button. The lapel cam? Of course it was on. Oh, how could I be so, oh, I see what you mean. Chris finally caught on. Last summer and fall, I effectively served as the interim sheriff while my predecessor, William Bud Roberts, was in a lame duck phase and absent from his duties. During this time, I not only ran a campaign to succeed Bud as sheriff but also managed the day-to-day -day operations of the entire department. One of the most impactful decisions I made was to use funds from seized and forfeited narcotics to equip every deputy in the department with wolf com body cameras. These cameras were affixed to the shoulder lapels of their uniforms and provided high-definition 1080p resolution video along with crystal-clear audio, capturing every encounter they faced. The video was transmitted via Bluetooth to the onboard video recorder, which also synchronized with the dash cameras in the deputies' cruisers to record video and audio simultaneously. 
Every department that adopted these cameras witnessed a significant decrease in citizen complaints alleging harassment or excessive use of force. In fact, while complaints were still filed initially, they were often withdrawn once the individuals involved or their families viewed the recorded video footage of the incidents. The cameras, no larger than half the size of a palm, initially stirred mixed feelings among my deputies. On one hand, they felt somewhat like Big Brother was monitoring them. Yet, already the footage had confirmed six incidents reported by my deputies, incidents that had sparked citizen complaints. Remarkably, all six complaints were retracted after the involved parties and their lawyers reviewed the recordings. I was ecstatic, eagerly anticipating the footage myself. I hoped it would furnish the evidence and momentum necessary to proceed with my plans to divorce my unfaithful wife on terms dictated by me. Chris retrieved the video from his patrol car and transferred it to my laptop. The recording began with Chris casually approaching the steps leading to the front porch of my farmhouse. He rang the doorbell twice until Clarissa finally emerged. Her expression, captured clearly on camera, revealed her shock at seeing a deputy at her doorstep. Can I assist you? she inquired. Are you Clarissa Marie Quinn? Chris asked. Oh, come on, you know it's me. What's this about? Ma'am, I'm Deputy Lieutenant Chris Hayes, he stated, handing her the manila envelope. Mrs. Quinn, you have been officially served. What? Are you kidding me? No, ma'am, you've been served. Oh my God, I can't believe this. I can't believe he would send one of his deputies to do this. Good afternoon, ma'am, Chris said, turning and walking back to his cruiser. Hey, damn it. Clarissa forcefully nudged Chris in the back. I'm not done with you. Tell that guy he better be home for dinner. This isn't acceptable. He needs to get home so we can sort this out. Ma'am, please calm down. I won't tolerate you touching me like that, Chris said, trying to remain composed. Or what? What are you going to do about it? You're just a lowly deputy. You're nobody. Ma'am, I'm warning you. Step back and calm down. Now you want to tell me what to do? I'm still the sheriff's wife. Clarissa advanced, brandishing the manila envelope as though threatening to strike him. Tell Patrick he better be home by six. No visits to his mistress on the north side. Ma'am, calm down right now. Chris reached out, placing a hand on her shoulder to halt her approach. Instead of calming her, it triggered Clarissa into a full-blown meltdown. Get your hands off me, you jerk, she yelled, swatting his hand away. Don't you dare touch me ever again. And then, smack. Clarissa slapped Chris hard across his right cheek. And tell that guy to get his ass home right now, she shouted, turning and storming back into the house. Oh my god, that was amazing, I exclaimed, bursting into hysterical laughter. But seriously, Chris, why didn't you arrest her right there? To be honest, Chris replied, I was so stunned I didn't know what to do. I wasn't sure whether to cuff her and take her in or leave it for you to handle. So I came back here and left the decision up to you. No way, Chris. You're going back out there and arresting her for assaulting a police officer, I insisted. You're already knee-deep in this, and wouldn't you love a little payback? Imagine how satisfying it would be to take her to jail, book her, and snap her mugshot, basically to totally humiliate her for slapping you. Are you serious, Pat? You're dropping me into this mess. Dude, you're already in it. Plus, don't you want to even the score? It's your chance to show her who's boss. Chris paused and sighed. I admit your arguments have their merits, but I'm not going alone. If she keeps pushing me, I can just stun her. It wouldn't reflect well on my record as a law enforcement officer, especially considering she's the sheriff's wife. And Pat, you do realize that this is likely to make the news, right? Don't worry about it. I'll deal with the press, and she can't stay here. Our prison is overcrowded. She's being transported to Shaka County tonight, which is a two-hour van ride. It's not our problem. She made her bed, and in several ways, now she has to lie in it. So are you sending someone with me? 
Chris asked. Who's the lieutenant on duty? I asked. Angel Ryerson. Great. Have Angel and one of her assistants meet you there. Let's demonstrate our strength. But it won't upset your kids, Pat. No, this weekend, he and a youth group from St. Mattis will stay at a hotel with an indoor water park in the Twin Cities. They'll be at the Mall of America, probably spending most of their time at the pool or Snoopy camp. I thought it was renamed something like Nickelodeon, Chris said, grabbing his hat. Yes, but everyone still calls it Camp Snoopy. Okay, Pat, it's time to arrest your wife. Good luck. Call me when you're done. Predictably, Clarissa's arrest was far from smooth, especially for her. She resisted so fiercely that she nearly faced an additional charge for obstructing arrest. Video footage captured Lt. Angel Ryerson, a petite powerhouse at just 5 feet 3 inches tall, physically restraining Clarissa on her doorstep while Deputy Brad Lowe applied handcuffs and informed Clarissa of her rights. Throughout the ordeal, Clarissa hysterically cried and shouted at Brad, Angel, and Chris, threatening lawsuits for wrongful arrest and excessive force. The incident was recorded in vivid 1080p detail, with clear audio capturing every curse and sob adding to this video evidence of. Her being served legal documents left no doubt in any judge's mind about the deputy's professional conduct throughout. By 6.30 p.m., Clarissa had been photographed, booked, fingerprinted, and processed into Mason County Jail. By 7 p.m., she was clad in red and white striped prison attire, complete with matching red crocs. Tears streaming, she was escorted to a van bound for Chalk County Jail, nearly two hours south of Cherokee Flats. The Chalk County Jail has a capacity for 240 prisoners, whereas our own jail could only accommodate a maximum of 40, and when full, our jail was severely overcrowded. This was a situation I was determined to address as sheriff, making it one of my top priorities. Since there was no magistrate judge working over the weekend except in cases requiring emergency warrants, Clarissa now had nearly 72 hours to contemplate her actions. A brief call to Sheriff Garrett Mears in Chalk County ensured that Clarissa would have a cell to herself, away from other inmates who might pose a threat. Sheriff Mears also assured me that his correctional officers would closely monitor Clarissa and maintain strict confidentiality. She would be processed into their jail under an alias to ensure her presence and identity remained undisclosed. Chris Hayes sent me a picture message on my smartphone containing Clarissa's booking photo. It was a profoundly disheartening image. Physically, she remained quite attractive, yet the photograph did not capture a youthful, confident woman. Instead, it portrayed someone who had reached rock bottom, grappling with the consequences of her actions over the past couple of years. Her eyes reflected deep-seated fear and universal anxieties, while her expression conveyed a sense of hopelessness and despair. In some ways, her face resembled the mugshots of countless women and men who have passed through jails across our nation throughout history. Clarissa had never borne the countenance of a criminal before, yet this photo instantly stamped her with the image of a common offender. Ironically, despite its bleakness, the photo seemed to align with the image I had formed in my mind of Clarissa since her affair with Bud Roberts began. It's intriguing how a single photograph can serve as a stark reminder of how fragile the boundary is between society's elite and its outcasts. I had planned to spend most of the weekend with my new fiancé Shannon Sullivan and her wonderful daughter Bridget. However, due to the incident involving Clarissa's arrest, I had to stop by the acreage to feed the horses and take care of a few other things. It wasn't until shortly after 7.30 p.m. that I finally made it to Shannon's place, around the same time Chris Hayes texted me Clarissa's booking photo. Entering Shannon's small yet cozy home, I was welcomed by the comforting aroma of a home-cooked meal that instantly brought back memories of meals prepared by my dear grandmother. Shannon and Bridget had arrived home just before me. Shannon had finished her nursing shift in the ICU at Holy Family Medical Center at 7 p.m. and then picked Bridget up from a friend's house, where she had been after school on the day Shannon worked. Patrick. Bridget called out as she dashed toward me from the kitchen. Hey, Bridget, I greeted her, lifting her up in a warm embrace. How are my two favorite girls in the world? We're great. 
I've been waiting all day to see you, Patrick. Want to see my bug collection? I'd love to, sweetheart. But why are you collecting bugs in the middle of winter? Mom and I caught them last fall, silly. Her teacher kept all the kids' bugs on display and finally sent them home today, Shannon explained, leaning in for a kiss. Her voice softened to a sultry tone as she smiled and said, How are you, handsome? Much better now, I replied after the enticing kiss. Rough day at work? Shannon asked, her expression turning concerned. I'll fill you in after dinner. All right, she nodded. For the next twenty minutes, Bridget animatedly shared stories about her bug collection and her day at school until Shannon set down a generous plate of meatballs and mashed potatoes on the table. I marveled at how quickly she could whip up such a comforting meal. It turned out Shannon liked to prepare five or six full meals over the weekend and freeze them, making weeknights easier with just a quick oven warm-up. If only I could run the sheriff's office as smoothly as Shannon ran our household, it only confirmed that I had indeed chosen a winner. After dinner, I assisted Shannon and Bridget with clearing the table and tackled most of the dishes, my way of showing appreciation for the delicious meal. We played Bridget's favorite board game, Bonkers, before it was time for her bedtime story. Tonight, I read her The Lorax by Dr. Seuss. Once Bridget was tucked in, I joined Shannon in the living room. She had changed into pajamas and a Minnesota State sweatshirt, sipping juice instead of her usual wine. No wine tonight? I asked. Not tonight, love. I've got work tomorrow and promised Mindy Sutherland I'd cover for her at six. Mom's coming early to take Bridget to the ranch for the day. Ah, I see. She'll have a great time, I'm sure. You're welcome to a glass, though. I think I will, I replied, pouring myself a generous glass of Chardonnay. I'm no wine expert, unsure of the rules about when to drink it, but Shannon's peach chardonnay suited me just fine. I settled beside her on the couch, letting go of the day's stress and my first week as sheriff. That was the sigh of someone who had a tough day. I thought things were going pretty smoothly until now. They are mostly, I replied, taking a long sip of wine. But this afternoon changed things a bit. How so? I gazed into Shannon's eyes and said, I had Chris Hayes deliver the divorce papers to Clarissa this afternoon. Shannon tensed up, visibly anxious. Oh my god, it finally happened. You're really getting divorced? She gripped my left hand, trembling. This is real? We're really going to be together? Tears welled in her eyes, one streaking down her cheek. Yes, we are, babe. I assured her, squeezing her hand. How did she react? I sighed deeply and closed my eyes. It was a complete disaster. What happened? You won't believe it if I tell you. Patrick Quinn, don't leave me hanging like this. That's not fair, she scolded. Okay, okay, you're right. Chris Hayes, my day shift lieutenant, served her the papers this afternoon. Clarissa flipped out on him, called him names, cursed him out, the whole nine yards, and then, I paused for effect, she slapped him across the face. Shannon gasped in disbelief. Oh my god, you've got to be kidding. Your worst nightmare? I'm not. You should have seen how upset Chris was when he came back. He was extremely distressed. What happened next? Well, if you really want to know, I began. Oh, don't keep me in suspense. Tell me. I sent Chris back to the house with my evening shift lieutenant, Angel Ryerson, and another deputy named Brad Lowe. I had them arrest Clarissa for assaulting a law enforcement officer. Another gasp of surprise. Oh my goodness, are you serious? What on earth were you thinking? What do you mean, what was I thinking? I replied, somewhat surprised. Clarissa attacked one of my deputies. She's no different from anyone else. It was a completely unprovoked assault. I understand, but legally she's still your wife. I know she's done some terrible things to you, but should we really have her arrested? This isn't about revenge for what she, Bud, and Marlon Lawson did. This is a consequence of her losing control and attacking one of my deputies in anger towards me. 
regardless of our feelings about each other, there's no excuse for her to assault one of my deputies. I also need to make it clear to Chris and my team that I won't tolerate any kind of abuse toward them. I know, I know, Shannon replied, calming down. It's just all so shocking. I'm struggling to process everything that's happening. I know, honey, I know, I reassured her, squeezing her hand tightly. So how do you think this will affect everything? Well, I said, the only thing I can think of is maybe this will make Clarissa more open to the idea of divorce. Perhaps this incident can help convince her to consider an amicable separation. Once again, Shannon's face registered shock. Oh my goodness, Patrick, I don't want to come off as unsupportive. Did you have her arrested just to leverage your divorce? No, 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 I responded firmly, shaking my head. Absolutely not. Please dismiss that thought right away. I would never stoop to that level. Doing so would lower me to Clarissa and Bud Roberts' standards. Let me be clear, Clarissa broke the law by assaulting one of my deputies. That's why she's spending the weekend in jail. I'll do everything within the bounds of the law to assist her, but I won't deny that I intend to use this to ensure the best start for us legally. If that means using her arrest to facilitate a smooth, amicable divorce, then I'll do it. But understand, I won't use it against Clarissa in our divorce proceedings. My goal is to help her see reason and minimize the impact on our boys. You're right, Patrick. I should have known better. I know you're not that kind of person. I'm really sorry I brought it up. Shannon leaned over and kissed me to apologize. Don't worry about it. I replied. I rely on you to keep me grounded. Bud Roberts clearly let this job get to his head, but I trust you to be my anchor, babe. Well, Shannon said with a playful grin, placing my wine glass on the table, I may not know much about dropping anchors, but I'd appreciate it if you took me to bed and, let's say, docked your ship in my little port. I burst out laughing. What did you just say, love? Come on, Patrick. I'm trying to be attractive and add a little hint. Hey, I enjoy a bit of dirty talk as much as anyone else, but you'll have to step up your game if you want to impress me. Shannon confidently stood up and began to take off her Minnesota State sweatshirt. So, Sheriff, she whispered after another thrilling kiss, are you going to make love to me or what? What? Oh, of course, I readily replied when she led me to her bedroom. The next two hours were incredible. The next morning, Shannon left for work shortly after 5.15 a.m., but not before we had another quick and intense session. I couldn't get rid of the incredible thoughts about her when she ran out of the house without even taking a shower and carried the smell of Sheriff Pat Quinn with her all day long. It wouldn't matter to any normal person, usually, a little deodorant and a change of clothes are enough. Shannon, a natural beauty who rarely used makeup, didn't need it anyway. After Suzanne, Shannon's mother, came to look after Bridget, I slipped out of the house. I headed back to the farm to do some chores and figure out how to spend the rest of the day. My divorce lawyer was Danielle Nichols, known in the city for her harsh reputation. If I hadn't hired her first, Clarissa would probably have approached her herself. This became apparent when Clarissa called Danielle shortly after I hired her, wanting to be ready in case she couldn't talk me out of a divorce. All this happened last fall before I officially handed Clarissa the documents. I found Danielle in her office at Brown, Graham, Norris, Slater, and Nichols. Even though the firm was closed for the weekend, given recent events, I thought it wise to warn her. As expected, Danielle was furious about Clarissa's actions, especially because of her quarrel with one of my deputies. Looking into the eyes of Danielle Nichols, Esquire, was like looking into the eyes of Satan himself. I was glad she was on my side. Danielle had a striking beauty, her charm was both attractive and dangerous, like a black widow spider that can devour you after mating. No matter what, I couldn't deny a certain attraction that would be dangerous if I were still single. About fifteen minutes into our meeting, my cell phone rang unexpectedly. It was from a number I shouldn't have had saved, but it was programmed into my phone nonetheless. The caller ID displayed Caroline Bennett. Hello, Caroline, I greeted as I answered the call. 
Patrick, thank goodness I got through to you. Can you please tell me what's going on with Clarissa? She called me this morning saying she's in prison in Cherokee Flats and that you're the reason she's there. If you find this video interesting, please hit the like button. If not, please hit the subscribe button. Excuse me, I said to Danielle, covering the phone with both hands. I need to take this call. It'll just be a few minutes. I apologize. No worries, Danielle replied. Feel free to stay here. I'm going to check if there's any coffee in the break room. Once Danielle had left the room, I continued the conversation. Well, Caroline, the truth is Clarissa is indeed in prison down in Cherokee Flats. There wasn't space for additional inmates here in Red River Falls, so she was transferred to another facility. My goodness, Patrick, what could she have possibly done to deserve you sending her to jail? Caroline, I want to be completely clear, even risking our close friendship, I didn't have Clarissa arrested out of any ill will. I followed standard procedure by filing for divorce and involving the sheriff's department. I paid the required fees like anyone else would. I did it to prevent what I feared would be a volatile confrontation with Clarissa. Instead, she instigated an altercation with one of my deputies where she became aggressive, belligerent, and slapped him. No, Patrick, you're mistaken. Clarissa can be hot-headed, yes, maybe often, but she would never intentionally strike a police officer. I find it hard to believe. Your deputy must be mistaken or exaggerated. I hate to say this, Caroline, I sighed, but the whole incident was recorded on video. Cameras and photos don't always show the full story, Patrick. True, but in this case, it's pretty clear-cut. All my deputies wear body cameras that capture everything in high definition. It's as good as having a TV crew there. You'll see when you watch the video, Caroline. I could hear Caroline sniffling, trying to hold back her tears. Patrick, please, if our special friendship means anything to you, promise me you'll do whatever you can to help her. Please, for her sake and for the sake of my grandsons. Caroline, I responded, you have my word that I'll do everything possible to assist her. I promise you that I'll be meeting with her shortly, and I guarantee she'll be out on bail no later than Monday morning. I'm confident this weekend will be the last time she spends in a prison cell. Thank you, Patrick. That means a lot to me. You're welcome, Caroline. Oh, and Patrick? Yes, Caroline. She hesitated. Never forget how much you mean to me, Patrick. I know there's someone new in your life. I can only hope she treats you as I would treat you if you were mine, the way you deserve. Now it was my turn to search for words. I appreciate that, Caroline, and never forget how much you mean to me too. Goodbye, Caroline. We'll talk again soon. I'll look forward to it, she replied, and with that, she hung up. After I finished talking to Caroline, it took me a while to come to my senses. Even from hundreds of miles away, her voice could instantly evoke memories of the most powerful and exciting experiences in my life. Despite the fact that Caroline Bennett was over 50, she remained strikingly beautiful, possessing charm and sensuality that women half her age would envy. There was something about her that always attracted me. Having Shannon in my life has been a real blessing. To be honest, few other women would be able to keep me from spending time with Caroline if she wanted to. Caroline caught me off guard one day when I was trying to prevent a heavy hay feeder from falling on her. She gave me the satisfaction of being a few yards away from my wife and children, who could come in at any moment. Later, we had lunch together by chance, and Caroline was sitting at our kitchen table with a noticeable stain on her shirt right in front of her own daughter. What can I say? I have a weakness for women who are persistent in their desires. My duty is to protect and satisfy. As I was pondering these thoughts, Danielle returned to her office with two cups of freshly brewed coffee, placing one in front of me on her desk. She seemed the type who could easily exert her influence over me or any man, for that matter. She proudly described herself as happily divorced, previously married to Karsten Brown of the law firm Brown, Graham, Norris, Slater, and Nichols. Danielle had joined the firm as an associate attorney. 
her rise to partner coincided with her personal relationship with Karsten, who had divorced his previous wife shortly after Danielle joined the firm. The scandalous nature of their affair was fodder for gossip, perfectly illustrating the saying, there's not much to see in a small town, but what you hear sure makes up for it. Now, Danielle said, settling back into her high back chair, let's strategize how we're going to handle that unpleasant wife of yours. Danielle thought. I was crazy for trying to negotiate a fair divorce settlement. She was confident that she could leverage Clarissa's arrest to secure everything I desired, using the threat of more prison time for her. However, all I really wanted from Clarissa was a quick and uncomplicated divorce. My goal was a clean 50-50 split of our assets and shared custody of our boys. I preferred the boys to reside primarily with me on the farm while Clarissa could have generous visitation rights after school, every other weekend, and for a significant portion of the summer. In contrast, I believe Danielle just wanted to see Clarissa suffer like a worm on a hook. Personally, I simply wanted to part ways while preserving Clarissa's dignity, especially in the eyes of our sons. I hoped this approach would be enough to discourage any further conflict from her. I left Danielle's office just after 9 a.m. I needed to pay a little visit to another lawyer. I drove to the west side of the city, to a posh little neighborhood called Elk Run Heights. It was one of the newest apartment complexes in Red River Falls and had many mansions of the most influential people in town. The Fox Run Golf and Country Club was incorporated into the complex, and almost every home had a golf course in front of the entrance. Most locals could either swim in their pools or sunbathe in one of the sand traps, eliminating the need to go to the beach, at least in the summer. 5945, Elk Run Drive was the residence of one Marion Lawson Iskander, also known as the Mason County Prosecutor. Needless to say, Marion wasn't expecting me today. Considering it was the middle of January, I wouldn't bother the four of them. Marion, it turned out, preferred threesomes, especially with my wife and Bud Roberts. He also had a pension for which he could have been jailed for life, but it was a secret only between Marion and me, although it could easily have been revealed to the whole world if he had angered me. I approached the grand brick house and pressed the doorbell. Marion himself appeared shortly after. Jesus, he muttered at the sight of me. And here I was having such a good weekend. Good to see you too, Marion, I replied as Lawson lingered at the half-open door. So, are you going to invite me in? Not unless you've got a damn good reason, he grunted. Oh, I assure you, I have business to discuss. Does this concern me at all, he asked pointedly. Marion, I said sharply, everything I do has some connection to you. Marion rolled his eyes and reluctantly opened the door wider. My study's on the left, and for God's sake, take off your shoes so you don't mess up my newly refinished hardwood floors. Well, it's almost like we're settling in for a visit, I teased. Don't get any ideas. You're not staying long enough to watch the playoffs, and every beer in the fridge has Marion written on it, not Patrick. Doesn't matter. The Vikes were out ages ago anyway. Damn it, Pat, the Vikes were out before the preseason for crying out loud, he grumbled. How can you stand to support those losers? Hey now, to hate my team is to hate me, I retorted. Do you really want me to respond to that, Quinn? Probably not, I conceded. We entered the house and headed toward Marion's office when his wife Patty Jean noticed us from the sprawling open kitchen. The aroma of whatever she was cooking was irresistible, and my empty stomach reminded me that I hadn't eaten yet. Oh, hello Sheriff, what brings you here today? Patty called out from the kitchen. Before I could respond, Marion cut in. He won't be staying long. We have some important business in the study. Make sure we're not disturbed. Patty Jean looked visibly disappointed by her husband's stern tone, but her face lit up again when I added, it's great to see you, Patty. Whatever you're cooking smells amazing. Thank you, Patrick. You should come over for dinner sometime. I'd love to, and I'll bring my fiancé along with plenty of bad jokes and a big appetite. Patty Jean burst into laughter, but Marion quickly ushered me into his office, closing and locking the door behind us. 
By the way, you're not coming for dinner, Marion remarked as he gestured for me to take a seat in front of his grand oak desk. But Patty Jean just invited me, Marion. It would be rude to decline. Marion shot me an irritated glance from his flamboyant chair. Did you come here just to annoy me, Pat, or do you actually have something important to discuss? Tell Patty not to go overboard. I'm a simple man with simple tastes. Damn it, Sheriff, meatloaf, mashed potatoes, and gravy. Comfort food always hits the spot for me, especially in winter. I bet Patty could work wonders with that. Her cooking seems to be doing wonders for your figure, Marion, I chuckled. I'm giving you a warning, Pat. My deputies arrested my wife last night. Lawson's jaw practically hit the floor. What? Are you kidding me? No, I'm not. She was served with divorce papers yesterday, and she assaulted one of my deputies. Lawson stared at me wide-eyed. You know what Phil Robertson said best, you're a special kind of stupid, Pat. I mean, my God, who did the people of this county elect a sheriff? They elected someone who believes that neither they nor their families are above the law. Rubbish. What happened? Did she accidentally bump into him? Nope. She got angry, took it out on my deputy, and slapped him across the face. We have it all on video. Who? Who? I asked, confused. Who was the deputy she slapped? Lieutenant Chris Hayes. Oh Jesus, Lawson said, grimacing and shaking his head. Figures. If that incompetent fool isn't messing something up right this minute to deserve a slap, then it's only a matter of time. He's probably getting slapped right now by his tattooed druggy girlfriend. I shifted uncomfortably as I prepared to defend Chris and Tanya. I can assure you, Lieutenant Hayes is not unintelligent, and neither is his new wife. In fact, she likely has the highest IQ in Mason County. The only mark on her record is a minor possession charge from Massachusetts. Are you kidding me? You let your damn deputy marry that woman? I know for a fact she sells a ton of weed out of her store up north. Fixing computers and selling old records doesn't pay the bills for that place. Actually, it does, Marin interjected. Tanya still repairs, upgrades, and sells computers and records. But she's also taken on contracts around town at my suggestion, working as a network administrator and analyst for several businesses. Every one of her clients sings her praises. She pretty much outshines every other IT guy in Red River Falls. I swear to God, Pat, if I find out you're covering up any illegal activity for her, I'll. You'll what? I cut in. Remember, I know what incriminating stuff you have on your home computer, I scolded, referencing the child pornography he still had. Marion stopped abruptly. After a tense pause, he said, you didn't come here to discuss Hayes and his mistress. What do you want, Pat? As I said, my wife is in jail for attacking Hayes. I need you to hold off on pressing charges until I give the word. That's my decision, Pat. I make that call, not you. No, you don't. Remember your unsavory personal interests. Damn it, Pat, Lawson sighed. I'm the county attorney. Sooner or later, you'll have to let go and let me do my damn job. I get that, but not yet. Just hold off on the charges until I say so. If anyone asks, which they shouldn't, just say there's an ongoing investigation and you'll make a statement when it's finished. How on earth do you plan to prevent people from discovering her whereabouts? She was booked into Shaka County Jail using an alias. Garrett Mears is a friend who's keeping an eye on her. Mears, the Shaka County Sheriff? Wasn't he the old guy who ran over a dead body a few months back? Yeah, that's him, I replied awkwardly. But to be fair, it was a wreck during a terrible snowstorm in the far west of his county, and the body was nearly hidden by snow drifts. The state patrol should have marked the location. I'm sure that was a great comfort to the family, and I bet the undertaker appreciated it too. How far did he drag the body under his Tahoe before realizing what was going on? Ah, uh, about 20 to 25 feet. Look, let's stay focused here. 
are you going to cooperate with me on this or not? Fine, fine, Lawson sighed, dismissing me with a wave. I won't file any charges for now. I'll pretend I don't know anything until late Monday afternoon, or until you decide whether you want to press charges. Are you doing all of this to gain leverage in the divorce with Clarissa? Not entirely. Well, maybe a bit, but mainly to get her to agree to the divorce itself. The terms I'm proposing, though it's none of your business, are quite fair. I'm not out to screw her over, she's still the mother of my kids. Pat Lawson paused briefly. Andre, ah, uh, can I ask you something personal? Gee, Marion, are we having a heart-to-heart? -heart? I replied dryly. Hardly, he chuckled. Too bad. Go ahead, I said. What's going to happen with Clarissa when all of this is over? My eyes narrowed, and my stomach tightened. What do you mean? Well, he began, Clarissa will obviously be single again, and I was, um, wondering if you would have an issue with. Don't even think about it, I interrupted sharply. What's the problem, Pat? It's clear you won't be with her, and my marriage is practically over. I would take care of your boys. I stood up abruptly, slammed both hands on Lawson's desk, stared him in the eyes, and growled, my boys already have a father, and my soon-to-be ex-wife is off-limits to you, Marion. Do you understand? Do you? Lawson sighed heavily, raised his hands in resignation, and said, All right, have it your way. But if I help you with this, Pat, we'll be even. I want these damn pictures deleted from my server and the hidden photos deleted from the internet. Is it a deal? Let me get something straight, Marion. You and Bud Roberts were intimately involved with my wife. You had the nerve to tell me about it and try to shame me for it. Well, guess what? We are far from being equal. We're not even getting close. It will be a very long time, if ever, before we get even. I got up, went to the door of Marion's office, and unlocked it. As I turned the handle to leave, I looked back at Marion one last time and firmly stated, and those damn photos will stay where they are. I spent the night alone at the farm instead of with Shannon, even though I really wanted to be with her. Who wouldn't want to spend the night with such an incredible woman and her amazing body? However, I chose to be by myself and work on finalizing more details for my upcoming divorce. The next morning, I skipped Sunday Mass, and by nine o'clock, I was in my department-issued 2010 Ford Expedition. I took U.S. Highway 120, south towards Cherokee Flats. The drive took about two hours, and the route was fairly sparsely populated. The speed limit was 65 miles per hour, so I made good time. Cherokee Flats housed the Shaka County Jail at its north end. This newer facility included the jail, the sheriff's offices, and even an auxiliary courtroom for the county courthouse. The jail itself was quite imposing, much larger than the one in Mason County, which still sat atop the Mason County Courthouse. It featured a sizable exercise yard enclosed within three layers of chain-link fence topped with three rows of razor-sharp concertina wire. Only the foolhardy would attempt to climb over it, let alone do so three times. The Shaka County Jail differed from the Mason County Jail in another significant aspect, the visitation room. In both jails, visitors were only allowed for lower-risk inmates. However, while visitors at Mason County Jail could see inmates face-to-face, -face, those at Shaka County Jail had to use a video system that only displayed inmates on a closed-circuit television screen. The visitor's room was located completely opposite the jail, ensuring that visitors and inmates were never closer than 300 feet to each other. However, if you're a sitting sheriff whose wife happens to be incarcerated and you happen to be friends with the sheriff whose jail you're visiting, exceptions can be made. Hey, Pat, Sheriff Garrett Mears greeted me in his office. He has been the sheriff of Shaka County for nearly 20 years. Garrett is in his early 60s with a full head of perfectly coiffed silver hair and is still in remarkable shape for his age. How's the first week on the job going? It's going pretty well, Garrett. At least it wasn't until Friday, I'm sure. I want you to know that we've been keeping a close eye on her the entire time she's been here. Nobody knows she's in here either, nobody came looking for her or has been asking about her. 
She only made one phone call so far, and I believe that was to her mother. Yeah, I heard from her mother, she knows. If you'll follow me, Pat, we'll head this way. Although normal visitation is done by video only, we have to allow attorneys the opportunity to meet privately with their clients. So, we have a secure room down this hall where you can meet your wife. Thanks, Garrett, I really appreciate this. Happy to help, Pat, and by all means, stay as long as you need to. Thanks again, Sheriff. I was led into a small 8x8 room with a metal table and two metal stools, all securely fastened to the floor, presumably to prevent inmates from throwing them at their attorneys. The room was not equipped with audio or video recording to maintain attorney-client privilege. Before entering the jail, I secured my personal firearm and underwent a pat-down and electronic search. I waited about five minutes before the door opened. I stood up as Clarissa was brought in, fully shackled with handcuffs, ankle cuffs, and a chain that wrapped around her waist, securing her hands close to her body and linking to the ankle cuffs. The purpose of the restraints was to make it difficult for inmates to attack correctional officers and to make escape nearly impossible. The tall, athletic African-American female correctional officer escorted Clarissa to the stool on the opposite side of the table from where I was seated. Once she sat down, her ankle cuffs were secured to a hook on the floor, and her handcuffs were attached to a hook on her side of the table, further restricting her movements. Clarissa looked terrible, and that was an understatement. Her eyes were puffy and bloodshot, evidence of non-stop crying since she arrived. Her hair was tangled and matted, and she clearly needed a shower. She avoided looking at me, doing everything she could to hold back more tears. How are you, Clarissa? It was a foolish question, but it was the only one I could think of. How do you think, she whispered. I understand how you feel. No, you don't, she said unable to hold back the tears any longer. How could you possibly understand? So how could you do this to me, Patrick? I leaned in and said, I didn't do this to you, Clarissa. You are here because you assaulted one of my deputies. I'm sorry, she cried, wailing and sobbing. I only got upset because I thought he was there to tell me something bad happened to you. That's not true, Clarissa, and you know it. You know exactly what the procedures are in the event of an officer down. You've been through it before, remember? You knew very well that Chris Hayes wasn't there for that. I swear to God, Patrick, that's what I thought. I don't care what your deputy told you, she sobbed, still unable to look directly at me. No, Clarissa, you didn't. I have the whole thing on video. How could you possibly see anything? His car was parked in the driveway. Patrick. It's my word against his. Clarissa, several months ago we purchased small cameras that the deputies wear on their uniforms, just like their radios. The cameras captured the entire event. Chris Hayes approached you, served you the papers, and then you followed him back towards his car. You deliberately pursued him, being belligerent and provoking him the whole time. He put his arm out to stop you from approaching him and then you used your left hand to slap Chris on the right side of his face. I have the whole thing on my phone. See? I took out my smartphone and pulled up the video clip, then began to play it. Clarissa initially refused to look at my phone, convinced until the very last moment that there was no way the entire situation could have been recorded. However, the moment she heard the unmistakable and crystal clear sound of her own voice, she stopped crying instantly and stared blankly at the video, too shocked to speak. When the video finished playing, Clarissa looked away from me again, this time in shame. Patrick, what's going to happen to me? she asked. Well, I said, putting my phone back in my pocket, that all depends on you. Right now, you're facing an assault charge, specifically assault of a peace officer. That's an aggravated misdemeanor. You could theoretically be looking at two to five years in prison. Oh my God, she whispered. Please tell me you're going to help me, Patrick. I will help you, Clarissa, but you're also going to help me. What do you want me to do? I want you to sign the divorce papers. I want you to accept them, sign them, and make this entire process as smooth and painless as possible for us and for Nick and Jake. Is that what this is all about? 
you had me arrested to get what you want in the divorce? She burst into tears again, seething and struggling to control her breathing. No, Clarissa, make no mistake. That's not why you ended up in jail. You could have just accepted the papers and lost your temper with me later. Instead, you chose to go off the deep end and landed yourself in prison. It was assaulting my deputy that got you here, not me. If you understand anything, make sure it's that. How is helping you divorce me going to help me? I'm going to help get the charges reduced so you only get sentenced to time served, or if I'm really lucky, I might be able to persuade Deputy Hayes to drop the matter altogether. But I'll only intervene if you agree to make our divorce as smooth as possible. Do you agree to this, Clarissa? She looked up at the ceiling in desperation. What choice do I have? It's simple. You can either choose to help yourself or not. But I don't want a divorce, Patrick. How many times do I have to say it? I don't want a divorce. I don't want to split up our family. I want us to stay together. Clarissa, do you remember what we talked about before we got married? Do you recall what we said would happen if either of us ever cheated? Tears streamed down her face as she closed her eyes, recalling our conversation from long ago. We always agreed that infidelity was a deal-breaker. You wouldn't tolerate it from me, and I wouldn't tolerate it from you. We said we could handle anything except cheating. But I was wrong, Patrick. I think we can survive this if we just work on it. I want to work on it. I want us to love each other again, like when we first fell in love. I want us to feel special again. I want to feel your love and make love like we used to, Patrick. You know what, Clarissa? I'm hearing you say I a lot. In other words, it's all about you. This whole sorry affair has been all about you and what you want. You know what I've yet to hear from you? I haven't heard you say, I'm sorry, Patrick. Sorry for the hell I've put you through these last two years, sorry for the pain, heartache, and humiliation I've caused you. I've never heard that from you, Clarissa. And if you say it now, it won't mean anything because you'll only be saying it to get out of here and to escape a tough situation. There's no easy fix for this. There's no easy way out. But I really am sorry, Patrick. I'm sorry I haven't said it until now, but I believe we're stronger than we think. I've seen a new side of you, Patrick. I admit I took you for granted, but now I see how tough you are. I've seen how hard you fought back, and I know you can fight just as hard for our marriage if you really want to, she pleaded. But I don't want to, Clarissa. I don't want to fight this battle anymore. I just want it to be over. You have no idea what you've done to me, to our marriage, and to our family. All I see when I look at you is something that used to belong to me but was taken from me. If we ever tried to make love, I'd constantly wonder if you were thinking of Bud Roberts or some other guy you were with, torturing myself with thoughts of whether you wished you were with them instead of me. I'd always wonder if I was strong enough, eloquent enough, or loved enough to satisfy you. I'd even doubt if you thought I was a good enough father to our boys. I can't go through that for the rest of my life, Clarissa. I just can't. Clarissa sat there quietly sobbing. I hoped it was because she was finally realizing the impact of what she had done to me, our marriage, and our family. Yet, I couldn't dismiss the possibility that she was mourning the lost opportunities she once had. Please try, Patrick. I'm begging you. I can't, Clarissa, I said, tears welling up in my eyes and a lump forming in my throat. There's too much to overcome. I'll never, ever be able to get over what you and Bud Roberts did. I know myself well enough to understand what I can handle and what I can't. You almost cost me my family and my very freedom, Clarissa. There's no coming back from that. Just please sign the papers. Sign the papers and I'll do whatever I can to help you get out of this mess or at least make it less terrible than it is. If you ever really loved me or cared about me, please do this one thing for me. At the very least, you owe me that. Clarissa held her head in her hands and sobbed for nearly five minutes. In the end, she struggled to regain some semblance of composure, wiped her tears as best she could, and then, with shackled hands, accepted a pen from me and signed the divorce papers, agreeing to all of my terms. 
I would give Clarissa half of the farm's equity and split all our savings equally. I would also keep her on my insurance until she found suitable employment with her own insurance or for up to one year, whichever came first. I would assist Clarissa in finding appropriate housing that could serve as a second residence for the boys, with the farm remaining their primary home. Additionally, I would pay up to one year's rent to help her get settled and continue making payments on her explorer until it was paid off. I would also cover her cell phone expenses for at least one year. My attorney, Danielle Nichols, thought I was crazy for agreeing to these terms. She was probably right. After all, Clarissa's mother Caroline was now involved with Martin Belmond, a multimillionaire many times over. I had no doubt that Caroline would do whatever was necessary to support her daughter. I did all this to ensure I treated Clarissa fairly and to prevent any accusations of trying to cheat her using her time in prison as leverage. Some might think I was being a jerk, but if things had gone differently and Clarissa and Bud Roberts had succeeded, it would have been much worse for me in ways I can't even fathom. Bad things happen to cops who go to prison. I did have a surprise in store for Clarissa, though. I managed to secure a release order from Judge Hannah Bergen allowing Clarissa to be released on her own recognizance. It was quite unusual, especially since I had to personally visit the judge at her home to get the paperwork signed. Even though Clarissa was held in Shaka County Jail, the case originated in Mason County, so our jurisdiction held. Certainly, there would be public outcry over this decision, but I was indifferent by this point. The positive aspect was that it would bring Clarissa joy, the downside was the prospect of driving two hours home with her. Sheriff Meyer's team took about 45 minutes to complete Clarissa's release from Shaka County Jail. This included giving her a private shower before release, signing paperwork, and collecting her few personal belongings. I had brought a change of clothes for her, and by 1 p.m., we were leaving Cherokee Flats and heading home. We sat in complete silence for nearly an hour before either of us spoke. Eventually, I couldn't bear it any longer. Are you hungry? I asked. Clarissa continued to gaze out the passenger window and shook her head. At least, would you like to stop for a drink? I don't want a divorce, Patrick. I signed the papers, but I didn't want to. She wasn't crying actively, but tears streamed down her face. I kept both hands firmly on the wheel and gripped it in frustration. I took a deep breath through my nose and exhaled slowly. Clarissa, we've already discussed this. It's final as far as I'm concerned. If you're trying to torture me, Patrick, it's working. I couldn't take it anymore. I hit the brakes hard without locking them and pulled over to the side of the road, slamming the lever into park. Torturing you, Clarissa? What about me? Huh? What about torturing me? Do you think life with me would be torture, Patrick? Damn it, Clarissa, can't you see? I'm not talking about living with you. I'm talking about the mess I'd be in if your fling with Bud Roberts had worked out. But it didn't, Patrick. It fell apart. Maybe there's a reason it did. Maybe we're meant to stay together. At least we need to try to move forward. I can't. Damn it. For God's sake, Patrick, why not? Why can't we try to move forward together? Why is divorce the only option? I looked away from her. Her indifference to her own falsehood and utter insanity now disgusted me both physically and emotionally. I sat for a while, trying not to see her pleading gaze out of the corner of my eye. I did my best to look away. It took all my strength to pull myself together, suppressing the urge to do something terrible to Clarissa. Then thoughts of Shannon came flooding back to me, bringing a familiar wave of calm. I focused on my purpose in life, closed my eyes, and imagined her, the feel of her body, the strength of her embrace, the taste of her lips, and the scent of her soap, lotions, and perfumes. At that moment, I regained enough control of myself to finally tell Clarissa what I'd been struggling to formulate all this time. I can't, Clarissa. I can't leave this in the past. To do so would be to return to who I was before, to someone who trusted you and loved you unconditionally, to someone who never doubted your loyalty and affection. What you've done has fundamentally changed me, Clarissa, on a deep level. 
your affair with Bud Roberts, your plans to destroy me, all of this has turned me into someone I could never have imagined becoming. It's both amazing and tragic. To save myself, I had to learn to think as ruthlessly as you and Bud. I had to cheat, beg, borrow, and steal to provide myself with everything I needed just to avoid getting into trouble. I have violated laws I pledged to uphold in order to serve what I believed was a greater cause. I have stretched legal boundaries to maintain the fabric of justice, protecting an unsuspecting public from dangerous individuals who might otherwise roam freely. Due to the actions of you and Bud Roberts, I have become everything I once despised, devious, manipulative, conniving, underhanded, and any other derogatory terms you can imagine. But I never did any of this for myself. I did it for my team, I did it for the broader public, I did it for you, and I even did it for Bud Roberts and Marian Lawson. Clarissa, my hands are not stained with blood, but they are certainly dirted. I'm not the righteous Dudley Do-Right I once was. However, the silver lining, Clarissa, is that your and Bud's actions have transformed me into a survivor. I can honestly say there is nothing I wouldn't do to protect my family, friends, and the people of Mason County from harm. I have stared death in the face due to my unwavering commitment to this cause and have lived to tell the tale, both literally and metaphorically. I shifted the expedition into gear, signaled, and merged the big SUV back onto the highway heading towards Red River Falls. So, Clarissa, you were right. I'm tough as nails. Fighting for your life, whether against death itself or an existence worse than death in jail, will do that to a person. I won't thank you for tearing our family apart, but in a strange way, I appreciate you for making me stronger. Without you, I wouldn't have been ready to take on the role of sheriff. I fell silent after that, and the rest of the trip passed in silence between my soon-to-be ex-wife and me. For Clarissa, it was truly a journey into the unknown, as she now had to determine her own path forward. Only she could decide which direction to take all. I knew that her future wouldn't include me, at least not as her husband. When we got home, Clarissa went straight upstairs without a word and went to bed. She must have been exhausted after spending the weekend in jail. Meanwhile, the boys returned from their youth group trip to the Twin Cities bursting with excitement to share their adventures. As I listened to their energetic chatter, I realized how fortunate I was that they hadn't been home all weekend. I would never have had Clarissa arrested if they had been here instead of 200 miles away. It was a stroke of luck for me but unfortunate for Clarissa. Clarissa eventually came downstairs around dinner time, greeting the boys with affectionate hugs and kisses on their heads. She then prepared a simple supper for us all consisting of grilled ham and cheese sandwiches. To my surprise, after dinner, Clarissa asked us to stay at the table. Unsure of what was to come, I watched as she explained to the boys that she and I were going to separate. She gently shared that despite our love for Nick and Jake, we were facing serious challenges in our relationship, and she would be moving out for a while. Clarissa went to the extent of stating that it was her decision, not mine, and pleaded with Nick and Jake not to be upset with me. She did stretch the truth a bit by saying she wasn't sure how long we'd be apart, explaining it was just enough time for her and me to resolve some differences we had. I believe her intention in leaving the timeline open-ended was to give the boys time to adjust to us not being together, which I appreciated. She reassured them that their home wouldn't change and they would stay on the farm they loved with their horses, cattle, dogs, and cats. Clarissa assured the boys they would still see both of us regularly, even though they wouldn't be with both of us at the same time. She even asked them to support me as much as possible and to help find her a suitable place in Red River Falls so they could visit her after school and return home to the farm each night. To their credit, the boys handled the news surprisingly well. Despite their sadness, there were tears, but they didn't completely break down or throw a tantrum. It seemed they might have already suspected that things would turn out this way. Nick had hinted at it over a year and a half ago when I was at the law enforcement conference in Minneapolis. Sometimes, as adults, we underestimate our children's intuition and understanding of the world around them. Shortly after, Clarissa managed to secure a lovely apartment in a newly built townhouse complex within a gated community. The complex included its own playground and pool, which the boys would likely enjoy over the summer, 
and it was conveniently close to their middle school, just six blocks away. Chris Hayes didn't need much convincing to drop the charges against Clarissa for assaulting a peace officer. I think he understood how challenging this situation was for all of us and recognized that Clarissa's actions stemmed more from desperate self-preservation than malice toward him or any other deputy. Mar and Lawson cooperated as I had insisted they would, and Judge Hannah Bergen played her part in making the case quietly disappear. If ever questioned, people might vaguely remember that something had occurred, but there would be no paperwork or report specifying what happened. Naturally, I didn't disclose any of this to Clarissa. I simply ensured the divorce proceeded as it should. When I shared all of this with Shannon, she offered me tremendous support, understanding the weight of my impending divorce. It wasn't that I desired to remain married to Clarissa, but rather I was grappling with the sorrow and regret of a failed marriage. What felt even more surreal was that I could now look forward to building a new life with Shannon and Bridget, emerging from the ashes of my past with Clarissa. Deep down, I believed my sons would warmly embrace Shannon and Bridget as their stepmother and stepsister. I anticipated there would be challenges along the way, but my intuition reassured me that our future held more joyous days than turbulent ones. Eventually, I even began to hope that someday the right man would enter Clarissa's life and bring her the happiness. I was utterly amazed when my future father-in-law announced that his wedding gift to Shannon and me would be paying off our mortgage. This incredible gesture meant we could shift our focus from mortgage payments to other aspects of our lives. It was far beyond what I had ever expected or felt deserving of. My initial reaction was to decline the offer because I was so taken aback. But Jack Sullivan made it clear that I didn't want to upset him and underscored his strong support for his daughter and granddaughter. Then, with a hearty laugh and a big hug, he welcomed me to the family. With that, a significant chapter in my life concluded, and a new one began, with all the essential characters in place. There's no point in looking back, we're now looking forward to a promising future. From this moment on, the only history that matters is the one we will create together. If you find this video interesting, please hit the like button. If not, please hit the subscribe button.